The studio of Joseph Walsh in Riverstick County Cork is one of the great citadels for making and thinking about making anywhere in the world today. Joseph was born here on his family's farm and about 25 years ago he began to use it as a studio as well, making furniture, objects of his own imagination, his own creativity. Those objects became more and more extraordinary over time. It got to be a little hard to say whether he was making furniture or making sculpture or maybe just drawing in midair. He was taking the recalcitrant materials and techniques of woodworking and transforming them into pure poetry. Over time, as his shop expanded, he began to attract other makers from around the world who shared his vision and had the skills to match. And as he learned, it also occurred to him that he was learning about making as an idea, making as a cultural force. He began to imagine an event, a gathering, that could bring people around the world together to think about the possibilities of craftsmanship and what it can offer to the world today. The result was Making In, an annual event where people come together and share their ideas, their stories, their objects, and ultimately think about not just the past, the traditions of craft, not just its present, but also the future, the future of making, the way that it can transform not just materials, but transform culture itself. Making is undergoing a real revolution at the moment. It's you know, a moment like I haven't experienced before. So many people are interested in it. So much creativity. And this really, on the global stage, is the single most impressive event devoted to the subject. There are people from all over the world, all different kinds of crafts, all different kinds of art form. And yet they share so much, they have a real commonality of interest, commonality of purpose. And I think Joseph Walsh is just so extraordinary in pulling them together. You're all very welcome. And it's great to have, uh, have so many of you back um, that have attended this event in the past. And um, so many of you that are here for the first time, you're all very welcome. It's so rich to get creative people to a place of making. Um, and I think it's a different type of conversation um, than, than the ones that we might have in institutions. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to those that have supported it. Uh, so we're here, of course, to celebrate making and what it brings to the world, what makers bring to the world. Uh, these figures uh, around us who we depend on, who we, who we love, whose work we love, and who bring so much meaning and conviction to what they do. And we're specifically talking about making in time. In the past, we've talked about other aspects of making, making in place, for example. Um, but today, we're going to be weaving in and out of this question of temporality. So we're not talking about time today in terms of just you know, the regular synchronous passage of seconds, minutes, days, weeks, months, years. We're talking about time as something perceived, something that has articulation, something that's personalized, deeply personalized and internalized. I was drawn to the craft by the ease with which willows could be grown. You simply plant willow cuttings into clear fertile ground in spring and they begin to grow. It has allowed us to live in a beautiful area and for myself to find a craft which has consistently engaged me. When you experience your material as a gift, I think it does change your attitude. Entitlement gives way to gratitude. I think one of the things that we think about when we think about craft, because we ourselves are makers of nothing, but thinkers of things uh, is how we can bring it into a scale that can also be architectural. If there is a correlation between visual harmony and, and uh, uh, audio harmony, sometimes when you see something that's made well, 
uh, is designed well, and the wood is is what it is. It it you know you look at it and you can almost hear it singing. Uh, at least I do. Mm. <laughs> so the outside is to be covered in these enameled fig leaves, and when opened, inside is a bare tree where you can just throw your clothes over. And each leaf takes about 18 hours to make, to paint. And there's 616 leaves on the cabinet. <laughs> but all this has a combination of, um, of a kind of elegance and, and delicateness that comes from, from nature, which I'm very fond, fond of. They sent me an image of Coco Chanel's apartment and that was at the Ritz, where she had these kind of crazy boiserie, gilded boiserie, and they said, you know, make something like that. But, you know, so, um, and I said, okay, sure. And so that's what we came up with. But then it was great because then it became a prototype, and these are installed in Chanel stores in Rome, Madrid, Beijing, Hong Kong, and Shanghai, I believe. For me, drawing is, I mean, it's very simple to say that's what I do because it is all I do, but it's also inherently what fascinated me. So, and I, I still don't think I've quite got it, so I keep doing it. Yeah. And drawing is, it's everything. You can be a sculptor, you can be a painter, you can be a fresco painter, can be all sorts of things, but you can't be an artist. An artist is something what you are. I want to pour my emotions into that material. We are both really interested in material, I mean the authenticity of material, how you use materials in such a way that exhibits their characteristics and that also that you can see the materials and that they uh, age gracefully over time. The closer we can get, or the closer we can stay between the material, the maker, and the thing itself, the happier we are. It's those timeless qualities that creators that we've met and heard about today brings to, to buildings. We see ourselves more as making places, and, and, and not to hijack that word, but we've been making places, particularly the last decade, around Dublin City, and we've taken a lot of pride in that. But also to promote the best in Irish design, best in craft making, best in architecture, and weave all of those ingredients into the buildings that we create. I think it's key to reviving our cities, but also key to making buildings and cities more about human beings. I'm interested in the hats of today and the hats of the future. I think, you know, we look so different to how we looked 50 years ago that I believe that there is potential for the head to be uncharted territory. Everything that happens has these consequences that if, if you're sort of alive a bit, you can aestheticize into interesting problems. I think the only contract with, with the world that an artist has is to show them something, which means that you can do anything you want. As our first speakers, uh, Billy Sien and Todd Williams, uh, who are in New York, uh, where, where I'm from as well. And um, I'm sure many of you will know their work. Uh, great architects, great designers of objects as well. Um, perhaps 
um, best known um, in the States these days, um, although many, many other wonderful projects for the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia, and then the forthcoming Obama Library in Chicago. Um, and you know that will be an incredible architectural tribute to our recent president. Um, so they'll be talking to you uh, in just a minute about their approach to making their approach to materiality and process as builders. I always like to remember when hearing from architects at this event that the word architect actually means master craftsman, master craftsman or master craftsperson, archi, head, and tech. Techne tech is the origin of architect. So um, no better field to hear from right at the outset. He understands space three-dimensionally. Sense of weight and the sense of movement through a space is really coming so much from you. Billy brings the wisdom, she brings the calm, she brings actually the sort of uh, sense of propriety to everything. That's really important for everybody in the studio because if I bring the kind of ripples in the weather and uh, she, uh, she brings the sun. Um, so this is our dear friend Stephen Eno who is a cabinet maker. Japanese American and a lovely person. Uh, and he a works poet. with himself and one other person occasionally. This is his studio. We had him make furniture there. By the way, there are a couple of mirror chairs there. But and in this, from in this case, George and Mirror on the table. Definitely uh, inspired by our visits to the Nakashima studio in the 80s. Uh, though we work with Stephen, and Stephen is meticulous, and here in this, we sent him out to California to buy some slabs of Clara Walnut and then make from two pieces of furniture from the slabs that he brought back. This one was a little bit inspired by the idea of a, a cabinet that could change from seasonally, so that the panels there, which are fabric and or mica, can be flipped back and forth. And uh, Stephen also worked, we worked together to make the hinges. Well, he didn't want to use a, a kind of chain stop, so he decided he'd fabricate this little wooden stop to keep the doors from uh, opening too far. This is Stephen more recently. His shop is a mess, I should say, and it's in Patterson, New Jersey, on the third floor of a rickety building. Uh, pretty fire, you know, great fire trap. But um, he's co he collected pieces over the years, and I go in there and say, you know, come on, Steve, let's, what can we do with this? And um, this is his beloved burl. Yeah, he a, loves this a brute, a brute a knot. And uh, so we had a recently had a chance to work with Stephen uh, to create a piece for the Mingye Museum. With Jennifer Luce. Jennifer Luce, who's a dear friend and a great maker and a lovely person. And Jennifer, we decided it didn't have much time, so Jennifer would make the base of the table and we would work with Stephen to make the armrest. So this is a bench, um, and a lot of times now benches, people ask for armrests or a, you know to give people the ability to push up. And um, I was thinking about the root chairs that you see, uh, come old root chairs from China that are made from these bent pieces of root. And then, of course, Stephen had the perfect root, so we just had to find out what part of the perfect root could work as uh, an armrest or something. Well, even George had some of those handles that are, feel like chunks of wood, which are kind of great. So we're definitely riffing on that. And then one of the pieces had to go outside, so we took it to a a metal caster, and this is a white bronze piece um, that we made from that. Or made from that. It was great fun. So, and little experiments in wood. Uh, Stephen did the benches for the Barnes Foundation, and, and has done a number of, the, of more normal projects. I think everything that we do, uh, and I know all of you who are involved in making or thinking about objects, um, always becomes a thread in the sort of weaving of the way you continue to think. So even those times, those things that are lost or those failures, they're all part of that thread um, that eventually makes the cloth. I think one of the things that we think about when we think about craft, because we ourselves are makers of nothing but thinkers of things, uh, is how we can bring it into a scale that can also be architectural. So 
as you saw on the bench, we're very interested in the object, but then we're very interested in a process that can grow and can inform a building. I think nothing, uh, nothing brings warmth as, as much as craft does in the hand. Yeah, so it is about and, and being not perfect. Most of our buildings are cold. I mean, we have to build big buildings with our relatively tight budgets. So we were asked to um, think about the interiors for um, what used to be Avery Fisher Hall and is now David Geffen Hall. It's the home of the Philharmonic at Lincoln Center, um, which has always been a kind of very sad space. And what we thought no, about yeah. is something that was... Beige. Well, that's what it was. Uh -huh. um, but what we thought about is something that is a, really about beauty, that is so beautiful uh, it might possibly make you cry. And I hope that in some way it responds to the music that will be made inside. So, and we didn't touch the outside because the outside uh, is very iconic. It's uh, part of that whole Lincoln Center uh, yeah. complex. Abraham uh, and Abramovitz. And uh, so these, this on the right there, your left, is a, a first collage Billy did um, of the th idea of this. And then later on, we took it back to Leora Manet, and then we also hoped that we might be able to do upholstery that was also had the same theme. So we had two little branches going. One is our daughter-in-law who went to RISD and happens to ha have worked at, at uh, Meharam and knows structure and created jacquard uh, seating of this idea, and then uh, worked with Lior to create uh, 18,000 square feet of, of uh, petals. So none of it is repeating, and the petals are much more intense at the top floor and become slightly less intense as, that they, go, as they go down through the tiers. So this wraps the outside of the symphony space. It's in all the public spaces, and these are some mock-ups. Um, where we were looking at the scale and the color. And this is at Leora Manet's space. And, and so here you can see some of the drawings that were done in order to lay out. Um, yeah, at the top floor, the, it's sort of the petals dropping down and then, well, of course, we're also trying to change the red of a typical philharmonic to a blue so that it's actually, and bring in other vibrant colors that feel, um, actually, this is two days ago. <laughs> Uh, the, the space is under construction, and this is uh, them beginning to lay out these. these uh... Yeah, so the opening will be um, October 6th. So it's a little crazy time there right now. But here you can see, start to see, and that, that is not the carpet. <laughs> that's not the baseboard. That was, that's not the baseboard, and that's not the finished painting. But um, we're on our way. Uh, it's interesting because as you get close, they're both quite durable and they also have some three-dimensionality. Yeah, so this um, fabric uh, was developed really for hospitality um, and for health care. So basically it can take lots of bad stuff. Um, and this, is, Todd was talking about this idea of um, the fabric for the seats. And so here uh, we're working uh, with the two women uh, from Maharam and our daughter-in-law um, in blue. And we're looking at different scales, once again, of the fabric pattern so that it is, once again, a kind of wash of petals when you walk into um, the performance space. And the idea that every seat actually is different. Um, orchestrating those is difficult, but Jacquard has a very, very beautiful uh, texture to it, and it's quite durable. And so they're really interesting close up. And then this is just the rehearsal. So uh, now they're tuning. Uh, it's kind of an amazing story because you think of orchestras just going in and playing, at least I did because I know nothing. But they need to um, adjust themselves to their performance spaces. And so they really had to learn to play both their instruments but play the, the space because it's a totally brand new configured space. So uh, at a time when we're all feeling, particularly in the United States, and I guess many countries, a little um, anxious, um, the beauty of the music was certainly something that could make you feel um, you could believe in life again. So that's it. Thank you.
I'm, I'm really going to talk about making. So this is the introduction of, of my way of making, but I'm, I approach making in many different ways. So I'll show you this approach to making through showing you different projects. And I'll start with Transglass. This is a collaboration with sculptor Emma Woffenden, who's here as well. And we started in 1997, cutting up wine bottles in her glass studio. And this led to a collection of tableware, which we produced by ourselves. And they're mainly made on relatively simple machines, like this diamond grinder. And this collection, Transglass, became quite quickly very successful. It was acquired by the Victorian Albert Museum and the Museum of Modern Art. And then shops around the world started selling it. And we kept making more and more Transglass in our studio until it was so much that we couldn't handle it anymore. And then we worked with other people in Guatemala City and we helped to set up a new glass studio where they recycle glass and they make the Transglass for us. And then around the same time, I, I made a collection of furniture called Rough and Ready out of simple and discarded materials. This was a self-initiated experiment. Um, and it was kind of a reaction against what was going on in design at that moment. And somehow this, this resonated. And I was asked to participate in art and design exhibitions, like here in Melmo and later in Tate Modern as well. And for these exhibitions, I designed a diagram with instructions, and people could take these away from the exhibitions. And the diagram is like it's a full-size template. You cut the wood, you light on top of the drawing, and you screw it together, and it helps you to make your own chairs. So this is a chair. We gave away more than 10,000 of these drawings. So in a way, this is a chair which is in production, but there's no, nowhere is a factory that actually makes these chairs. And in 1999, I took one of those chairs and I made a coffer for it and I embroidered this crow on it. And this was a really big moment for me, a moment where I really started to question the, the tradition in which I was educated and the heritage of modernism. I was longing for something warm and homely and became interested in the use of decoration and using motifs from nature. And in 2008, we, we started working in Dakar, in Senegal, where there's a tradition of weaving furniture onto a metal frame directly. Um, and this is also a moment of transition for me, where making is, not, is by hand still, but it's not by me, but it's by artisans. Here you see how simple the metal fabrication is. So it's, it's just bent by hand, everything. So I designed a chair frame, which is all made of two-dimensional curves, so they can bend it as flat pieces, and then they get welded together. But then once you start weaving onto these pieces, you get these fantastic shapes. That makes the shadowy chair. And then in 2007, I was asked by the English company Meta to design a piece of furniture based on 18th century materials and techniques. So the first part of the project was a lot of research and, and going back into museums and collections to, to understand that really. And this led me to two wardrobes, which we made with a very large group of artisans. And the second cabinet wardrobe is the thick wardrobe. This is designed to be made in enameled steel this is my first model in paper. It's the scale model, where we started from. And then, so the outside is to be covered in these enameled fig leaves. And when opened, inside is a bare tree where you can just throw your clothes over. For people who are very free mind. Um, this is Patrick Blanchard. He's a master wood carver in Paris. And he's here working on the central tree. He's carving this in lime wood. And here you see the tree against the design drawings. So there's, there's a lot of interpretation. So with, with this work, for example, or with, with work in Brazil, I, I try and give as few instructions as possible and let as much of the, of the maker kind of work on this. So from that wooden original, then a plaster mold is taken, which is then used to create a, the bronze tree in the center of the wardrobe through a lost wax pro casting process. 
And then there are 10 different shaped leaves to give it a naturalness. And each leaf is stamped to create, to make the vein pattern. And then it's painted with the enamel colors by hand. The enamel is fired onto the metal. Here you see the different stages of it goes through. And each leaf takes about 18 hours to make, to paint. And there's 616 leaves on the cabinet. <laughs> um, it's made in Birmingham. At that time, you couldn't get any other enameling done in Birmingham. Everybody was working on this <laughs> cabinet. Um, this is a black work, blacksmith's workshop in Normandy, where they made the, the, the structure of the wardrobe. So there's a metal tracery onto which the leaves will be fixed. And that is made according to this three-dimensional map. So the, the fixings end up where the leaves need to be in the end. So here you see the assembling of the leaves onto the frame. So each leaf is, is numbered according to this map. So everything is already planned out in its farms. It's the only way to get this real natural look. <laughs> um, and here you see um, one of the door panels when it's finished. This is look, seen from the inside. So you see the, how, how it's fixed onto the frame. Um, this is the finished wardrobe closed and then opened. <laughs> Peter's studio was actually the first one that I went back to after the lockdown. So I had been in my house, like everyone, um, for months, and then drove down to Brooklyn and walked into the studio, and it just opened up around me in this kind of industrial craft sublime. It's in quite a you know, it's in a quite industrial area of Brooklyn, in fact, and you walk in and everything is color and texture and a uh, kind of suffusion of um, creative energy. And in fact, it's not just Peter's uh, ceramic studio, it's also the studio of all of the people that work with him. So he has many assistants helping him in the creation of his very large scale ceramic murals. And he's actually created, again, a community alongside, so they have individual studios. And it's really a place of extraordinary life, very much like Joseph's studio here, in fact, although in a rather different setting. So here is the process of making these large wall-mounted uh, ceramic sculptures. They start on the floor and we put out uh, tons of clay and um, on the floor in this big steel frame and then uh, here's uh, after the, then we cut it up while it's still wet and here you can see us uh, glazing it and putting it in various kilns. I'm focusing um, mostly on these wall-mounted sculptures. Most of these uh, large sculptures are in private homes, although this piece that uh, is being gilded here is in the Cartier store on Fifth Avenue. So that's one of the few, um, few of my sculptures that you can see in a public space. This is, so this is installing at the Cartier store on Fifth Avenue. And so this is this wonderful commission I got from Laura Gonzalez, who's a wonderful architect in Paris. And it was thrilling to, um, to have the opportunity to do a piece in that context and then especially to see it realized and to see her vision of how um, my work would be used in such a space. This is a very different piece. Uh, we did a, I did a design fair um, last year at the Salon of Art and Design in New York in the Armory. And so I just created a big, I created a complete interior and so there's a table I designed and built, and the side tables and the lamps. And then I commissioned these wonderful um, aluminum artworks from Hei Wanson. And I guess I have to pay tribute um, to the people who help me and also for people who, make me, who help me make the work, but uh, also the very brave and uh, sometimes insane uh, designers and 
uh, collectors who are brave enough and interested enough to uh, uh, put these pieces in their homes. This is a beautiful project by Shahan Manassian, a designer in Paris. Uh, this, but the um, project is in a, one of those uh, enormous towers on 57th Street in New York. And so this, was in, this sculpture was integral to the interior design of the project from the very beginning. Uh, this is a fantastic uh, home in Athens. And I uh, was so happy to get there. I didn't realize this was happening until we got there. The, the, the ceiling is uh, this tobacco-colored lacquer. And so the whole, and, and then this, the window looks onto this courtyard that that's, has a gigantic reflecting pond in it. So the light is absolutely magical in this space. And I was very happy to, uh, to see this installed in real life. Uh, this is a fantastic project uh, I did for Peter Marino. Peter Marino did the Chanel stores uh, all over the world, but the prototype was the, um, the main Chanel store in London, which is astonishingly lavish as a retail environment. And so the uh, ceramic uh, sculptures on either side of the fireplace, they sent me an image of Coco Chanel's apartment at, that was at the Ritz, where she had these kind of crazy boiserie, gilded boiserie, and they said, you know, make something like that. But, you know, so, um, <laughs> and I said, okay, sure. And so that's what we came up with. But then it was great because then it became a prototype, and these are installed in Chanel stores in Rome, Madrid, Beijing, Hong Kong, and Shanghai, I believe. So this, but this is in a private salon in the Chanel store in London. And then um, I also collaborated with a wonderful plaster artist uh, in Brooklyn named Stephen Antonson who normally does very traditional plaster work, but he does his personal work are these, car he finds cardboard boxes in the street and then plasters them. And so I collected a group of those and then had them silver leafed and assembled them. And um, those are one of my favorite collaborations I've ever worked on. The client was so generous to allow us to come back and photograph. I often don't see the finished uh, interiors. I installed them and then I was so happy to go back after the, in, the, finish, the interior was finished because to see all the other elements, this beautiful, playful environment, and then to see the work reflected in this beautiful black lacquered table. What we hope as artists when we, when we create is that something of that feeling, of that energy, of that understanding of life, of that appreciation of life, of that appreciation of shape, that something of that will move out of it and go into the viewer. And that, if that's, that route is successful, then I think that is art. And if that has that effect on thousands of people, of all nationalities, through centuries, it becomes great art. So when we put our heart and soul into something, whatever it be, whether it be useful, not useful, beautiful, not beautiful, whatever we, whenever we do that, it absorbs our energy and our thoughts and the energy and thoughts of all those people who've made it, which is why the passageway outside is such a triumph. Yeah.